Uh, welcome to another monthly Beyond Zero Emissions discussion group. Uh, my name is Anthony Daniel. I'm a uh, volunteer with Beyond Zero Emissions on our radio and podcast show. Uh, we'd like to thank the University of Melbourne Energy Research Institute, a Zero Carbon Australia project partners, for this great venue which they provide every month. Uh, for the people that haven't been to one of our discussion groups before, BZD is a climate solutions think tank and a research organisation. Our goal is to transform Australia from a 19th century fossil fuel based economy into a 21st century clean tech powered economy. Our projects include the Zero Carbon Australia Research, uh, Repower Australia Talks, Media Work, Education Programs, and much more. You can find us at bcd.org.au in case you've got a smartphone there ready to go. We're all, always looking for more volunteers, so come and talk to us afterwards if you're, if you're interested and want to get involved. The discussion group is a forum for climate change solutions with presentations by experts in their field and it's held every Monday right here in this venue. Now, due to unforeseen circumstances, we apologise we'll be unable to bring you our advertised expert speaker tonight. We are, um, however, extremely lucky to have Gerard join us on short notice. Uh, Gerard Wedderburn Bishop uh, is a lead researcher for BZD's Zero Carbon Australia land use plan, which will be released during this year. He will present tonight on forestry and agriculture emissions. Uh, Gerard is executive director and lead scientist of the World Preservation Foundation, an organisation whose aim is to assimilate, document, and present scientific data related to climate change, including deforestation, disease, drought, and global hunger. Gerard has had a distinguished career working as a principal scientist for the Queensland Government Department of Environment and Resource Management Remote Sensing Centre until 2010. He was responsible for assessing and monitoring vegetation cover, structure and trends across the state. This involved leading a team of remote sensing scientists to develop satellite monitoring methods to cover an area of 1.7 million square kilometres each year. Following 37 years with federal and state government, Gerard is now engaged in communicating environmental issues and pursuing his life interest in sustainable home design. And Gerard joins us from Skype. Welcome, Gerard. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Terrific, yeah, I can. Thank you. All right, we'll, yeah. we'll hand um, over to you and we'll let you uh, tell us when to click through this PowerPoint slide. And uh, after you finish, we'll bring you to the group for uh, questions. Terrific. All right, thanks very much. And uh, I must say, uh, I apologise in advance uh, for this presentation. It was hacked together fairly quickly um, with short notice. Uh, we haven't put much material together yet for presentation of the land use plan. And you'll notice that this presentation is done on the World Preservation Foundation ahead. So um, this is not a BZD presentation. Uh, it's a sort of a teaser and pre-release information. But it's also a uh, bit of background on deforestation and agriculture emissions in Australia. And uh, let's get started. Can I have the next slide? Okay. Um, what I'll be talking about is uh, how hard it is to kill a forest. Um, fire. How that's used globally. It's, it's amazing. Uh, we'll talk about short-term emissions and how critical they could be for the planet. We'll talk a, a bit about civilization busters and the planetary boundaries that we're basing with tipping points. Uh, then touch on the land use plan from Beyond Zero Emissions. And talk about how agricultural emissions might save us and offer transformational opportunities. Okay, before I sh get started, I should really introduce myself. I resigned from Queensland Public Service as a principal scientist um, in 2010. And I did so because I read a report put out by our group, which is the Climate Change and Remote Sensing Group. And even some of my staff had worked on that report. And it was a greenwashing of the Queensland beef industry. Basically, the report said and that the reduction in deforestation across, across Queensland and the regrowth of trees on, um, on beef properties balance the emissions from the beef. And <laughs> I read that report and uh, hit the roof, stormed out or after, after talking to a lot of people very heatedly, um, stormed out and uh, never went back. 
Uh, I've actually, I did go back for a uh, for a send off a few months later and uh, gave them another talking to. <laughs> but uh, I actually thank you for uh, for everything because I reminded them that integrity is is uh, pretty much all scientists have. But uh, to get started, uh, we'll go to the next slide, which is actually a video of how they do deforestation in Queensland. So this is just a short video. get out of jail card 
which we used to offset industrial emissions. And you can see there that, that, that has dropped uh, rather dramatically. Um, next year, next slide, thanks. This is a breakdown of that deforestation for the year 2010 across Australia. And you can see that Queensland, well, up until then, Queensland was, was clearing more. But still, in 2010, Queensland has by far the greatest deforestation of any state. New South Wales and Victoria have uh, are small in comparison. This is by area, by the way. Sorry, no, this is metric tons, CO2 equivalent. Um, can I get an indication? Can anyone see these? Uh, see what's written on this graph? Perfect. Yeah, the numbers on the y axis. And the, the script, the descriptions? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that metric tons or metric tons? Question is, is it megatons or metric tons? Metric. Yeah. It's megatons. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to read? Does anyone want me to read any of that? No, it's fine. We can see it. Okay. John, Jerry. Okay, terrific. Great. And you can see that this graph's broken up into two categories. Um, the Department of, of uh, what's it called now? But it was DCCEE, Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. It, it produces figures on clearing for grassland, which is basically pasture land, and clearing for cropland. And you can see the darker blue, um, is, which is dominates, is the clearing for grassland. So in other words, the uh, grazing animals are responsible for the lion's share of that deep deforestation. Next slide. So this was, um, this is, the front cover of uh, one of our Queensland reports. We took great pride in these reports. We also produced a map each year which showed the cumulative clearings from when satellite monitoring com uh, commenced. We used to call it the $20 million map. Uh, it was growing. Um, but in that time, the average clearing in Queensland was 415,000 hectares per year. That's an area of 65 kilometres by 65 kilometres. 60% um, of that was remnant or virgin bush. Um, you saw from that video the sort of bush we're talking about. It can vary a lot from rainforest down to you know, sparse mulga, but that's sort of average what you saw. And 40% of that clearing was actually re-clearing. And this is really interesting because it raises the prospect of regrowth and therefore sequestration. If you think that 40% of that 415,000 hectares is, is trees that have regrown and have to be knocked over again, have to be pushed again, what they do is they push them together and they burn them. Uh, they don't use any of the timber. But um, that regrowth, you know, nature is incredible. It will bounce back really quickly if it's left alone. And over that time, over that uh, 21 years in this case of clearing, 93% of that was for livestock grazing. And uh, I've got a figure here at the bottom. New South Wales had 64,000 hectares in 2008 09. I grabbed that figure uh, for comparison or well, compared that to Queensland. Queensland now, by the way, is down to about 100,000 hectares per year. But it's increasing again since, uh, since the, the change of government. Next slide. This is the bigger picture about Australia. Um, we developed the country by clearing the trees. And we uh, cleared the trees off the good soil for agriculture. Uh, and the yellow areas there show the deforestation since settlement. Okay, next slide. Of the bits of Australia that we use, this is how we use it. Um, cities, urban and rural residential, occupy less than 1% of Australia. Mining, less than half a percent. Uh, water, 1%. Forestry, 2%. And you can see the others. But the lion's share of Australia is used for grazing. So this is a powerful thing because it this is where we have the greatest impact. Sure, the vegetation might be sparse and the potential might be lower, but the number of hectares 
square kilometres is vast. So this is huge potential. Okay, next slide. And just revisiting that point I made before was that 93% of Queensland deforestation was for grazing pasture. So these critters here, these, these ruminants you see on the left, they are the culprits when we talk about deforestation in Australia. We don't see it, of course. Very few people see it. But we used to drive the country every year and you'd be driving along with the laptop on your lap, you know, logging the, the deforestation. And you'd log, you know, start a deforestation and you drive and you drive and you drive. And 20 minutes later, you'd log end of deforestation. Because when they cleared, they cleared huge areas. You know, the, the, size, the scale of this was just unbelievable. Okay, next slide. All right, let's, <laughs> this is the fun bit. How to kill a forest. Next slide. Okay, nature bounces back so quickly. It's really, really hard to kill a forest. Um, logging on its own will not kill a forest. Even clear felling will not cure, kill a forest. If an area is an area of forest is clear felled or logged and left alone, it will revert to forest again. No question, it's just a matter of time. So how they do it, they first get rid of the trees. You saw how that was done in, in Australia. And actually the the centre of global deforestation now is actually in, um, in, in uh, Brazil, in the south of Brazil, called the Salado, and it's actually uh, dry tropics vegetation, a lot like Australia. And their method of choice for clearing is exactly the same as Australia. It's two dirty big bulldozers pulling a chain between them. So this, this is how it's done globally now. <coughs> we invented that. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, here's a couple of uh, motor secondary uh, snapshots of a 10-day period, <coughs> pardon me, two 10-day periods um, in August and again in November. And um, they're taken randomly, by the way. I took them, I grabbed them uh, some time ago. But you can go to the, the MOTUS uh, Pi Map website and you can look at the composites. But you can see that, um, uh, just looking at the lower, uh, slide that the the slide where uh, this is this is in uh, November, so it's the end of the southern dry season. And what we're seeing is Africa, south of the equator, is burning. It's the fire capital of the world. South America is also burning. Parts of Australia are burning. Parts of Southeast Asia, and also you can see parts of uh, Europe are burning and North America. Um, the, the upper slide shows you the northern end of dry season and you can see that Africa is still the fire capital. The, uh, the areas north of the equator, this is Savannah north of the equator, that's burning like crazy. They burn several times a year in Africa. Uh, northern Australia is still burning and South America is still burning. And they do that to stop the forest free growing. They also burn to kill off the old dead grass so the cattle, so the livestock has something to feed on. Next slide. You can see here, uh, this is an aerial shot in the Northern Territory showing um, the effect of excluding fire and excluding grazing uh, from the dry tropics. And you can see that this area where they've excluded fire and grazing for 20 years is actually regrowing. A lot of that will be uh, mulga and acacias, mixed acacias. You can see on the right hand side that they, that's an exclusionary for the last 10 years and it's on its way. And you can see in the foreground uh, this is an area where they burn regularly and uh, graze heavily, well, not heavily, to, to whatever extent they can. And you can see that nature does bounce back. If, if, these, if they pull the cattle off these properties, then um, nature does grip brown's back. But also, you know, this shows you the impact that grazing will have on the national parks up there if they continue to do that. Our next slide, please. All right, here's a hidden gem. 
this is amazing. No, no one knows about this stuff. In the Black Saturday bushfires in Victoria, it was about four and a half thousand square kilometres burned. Each year, 100 times that area is burned in Northern Australia. And you can see that on the, the map on the left, the frequency of fires is particularly frequent up to the top end. This is the real true savannah country. And the, the green areas, they're, they're, um, uh, they're, they're open savannas and, and uh, open woodlands. And these are used for cattle grazing, pretty much. And 90% of those fires, 90% uh, of fires in Australia are in the northern arid <coughs> and humid and humid zones. And 46 million hectares per year of savannah, that's about 460,000 square kilometres each year, is burned. And they're burned often. Um, the advice to farmers that the tropical savannas Cooperative Research Centre gives is burn, burn, burn. Um, throw the match. Don't be afraid to throw the match. That's what they tell the, the cow cockies. And uh, there's studies, a lot of work done in Northern Territory, uh, fire and um, linking, trying to link fire and fire, and it's not. In the north of Australia, the, the, uh, the lightning strikes uh, just totally disconnected. They happen in the wet season, they don't happen in the dry season. In the south of Australia, it's a different story. We do get dry um, lightning strike and therefore wildfires. But in the north of Australia, where 90% of Australia's fire happens, it's not started by lightning. It's started by throwing the match. Actually, the method of choice is drip torch. And it's either done out of a quad bike or from a helicopter. OK, next slide. <laughs> The global picture is um, an eye-opener as well. You can see at the top of this chart that Brazil is by far the world's leader in deforestation, <coughs> followed by Indonesia. And uh, we, we're clearing 13 million hectares per year, which is 24 hectares per minute. Still, most of it's occurring in the tropics. And uh, the, the latest studies show that all Pretty much all of this deforestation is happening for large-scale export-oriented agriculture. The people who live in rural areas now are actually decreasing, and all of the population growth, which we expect uh, in the next 50 years or 40 years, is, uh, is predicted to happen in the cities, not the country. So the, the rural populations are going to decrease and are decreasing, and the city populations are increasing, and big food must provide for those mouths to feed. So this is what's happening. Um, Brazil is being uh, is being cut down with gay abandon, most of it in the Cerrado, and pretty much all of that to grow soybeans and corn, mostly soybeans. And the uh, market for that is China. Asia it is uh, populations are booming, and the population and the, and the populations of pigs mainly are being fed by Brazilian soybeans. 95% of all soybeans globally are fed to animals. And the corn as well. Indonesia is a different story. Indonesia, um, they got a funny sort of dynamic happening. The biggest uh, reason for deforestation is uh, for uh, palm oil plantations. What they do is a uh, government gives a concession and they go in there, they log, and the, the money they earn from the logs, they uh, you know sort of ties them over until the, the newly planted palm oil palms grow to maturity, which is several years, I think about six years. So they get the money from the from the logging funds the um, the palm oil, but that's the biggest uh, biggest deforestation. So um, yeah, the, the the figures are that 80 percent of, of uh, 80 percent of all deforestation is for agriculture and 80 percent of, of tropical deforestation which is where the bulk of it is is for pasture and feed crops interestingly china is reforesting europe is reforesting and north america is reforesting they have a, an increase in forest areas whereas the tropics are being uh, targeted 
And at the moment, uh, 25 to 30 percent of global greenhouse gases come from deforestation. That's massive. Next slide. So we see that logging does not kill forests, but food kills forests. Next slide. Um, this, is a, this is a really interesting area, uh, short-term emissions. And it's, it's an area that has been largely ignored until fairly recently. Uh, next slide. This is uh, from the last IPCC report showing the effect of each of the gases, uh, the, the, the global warming attributable to each of the gases since 1750. So in other words, what impact has each gas had since industrialization began? And if you look at the red bar up the top, you see that CO2 is the outstanding leader. Fair enough. If you look at the next bar, you see that uh, methane uh, comes next. Now, within that bar, you'll see some interesting things which I'll point out later on. But they, the first red part is, is methane itself, CH4. The next yellow part is O3T, which is the tropospheric ozone, which very few people would have heard about, but it's responsible for that much global warming, and that's created by the methane. And, um, uh, H, yeah, and water vapour from the methane, and CO2 from the residual methane. That's the effect of all that cumulative have. Then we have halocarbons, nitrous oxide, and HFCs going down. Now, the, the next group, actually, um, methane's included in the top group because it's considered by IPCC to be a long-term gas, a long-lived gas. And they categorise that as the gases which are well mixed in the atmosphere and therefore have, can be, you know, you can quantify their global warming impact quite nicely. And that's one of them. If you go down to the next category, you see CO, carbon monoxide, NO, NOx, which is uh, nitrogen oxides, and NMVOCs, the volatile organic compounds. And these guys have been responsible for those, uh, those effects there. The next category get down, which is also a short-term uh, warming agent, is uh, black carbon, and organic carbon and uh, black carbon on snow. Okay, who would have thought that black carbon would be responsible for about a third of the warming of CO2, and yet, who's heard about it? Very few people. Who would have thought that, uh, that the short-term gases and the, and the <coughs> tropospheric ozone created by, by methane, carbon monoxide, etc would be about a quarter of CO2. Um, these things are not spoken about much because they come and go very quickly. Black carbon, for example, it goes up and within a few days it settles out or the next time it rains. Um, carbon monoxide, it goes up and down every day. Um, and talk about that a bit later. Uh, and then VOC, VOCs are the, the stuff that you smell. Um, bushfires produce a lot of this. Uh, I know some people might be able to tell the difference in the smell between a bushfire and a grass fire. That's because they have different combinations of VOCs. Um, but this gives you a picture that it tells a story that, that the long-term gases are not the only warming gases. Next slide, please. In uh, 2011, the um, uh, UNEP and the World Meteorological Office put out a report that said that if we target the short-term warming agents, particularly black carbon and methane, um, we can slow down global warming by half a degree by 2050, and we can cut it, we can limit it to less than two degrees, which is critical in, that, in those decades. Um, that report was not fully embraced by the climate community because they, well, some see it as a distraction. They see that the carbon dioxide message is hard enough to get across, but, uh, and therefore, uh, CO, and therefore the other short-term gases, uh, which are important, are, are going to be a distraction and they'll confuse people. So it was largely left off the agenda. Next slide. 
Okay, um, where do they come from? Black carbon comes from burning biomass. Ethane uh, comes from cows, biggest category, and fugitive emissions, next biggest category. That is from coal mining mostly, but also from fracking, uh, coal seam gas. And ground level ozone, who would have thought that the biggest source of ground level ozone is actually fire for agriculture, uh, both crop stubble, but the biggest source is actually savannah burning in the north of Australia, uh, for Australia this is. So uh, carbon monoxide, which is also a, a, a warming agent on its own, but a, a big precursor to tropospheric ozone um, is, is agriculture. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Actually, I'll just talk about that last slide a bit more. The, the global warming potentials of the short-term gases are huge. You've probably heard that methane is 21 times more powerful and potent than CO2. Uh, that measure was an early IPCC measurement over a 100-year accounting. If you look at the most recent measurement with the NASA global warming potentials, it's actually 33 times more potent. And if you look at 20-year accounting, which is more which is better for methane because it's gone in, 20, in 12 years. If you look at 20 year accounting, it's actually 72 to 105 times more potent than CO2. So, you know, the, the, the numbers are huge. Black carbon, for example, is 1,600 to 4,500 times more potent than CO2. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. And, yeah, okay, globally, 90% open fires are deliberately lit. And we talked about that before. And 40% of black carbon globally comes from pasture fires and bush fires. Uh, just while we're there, if you look up in uh, the north of this slide of the world, you see the Arctic. The Arctic and the Antarctic Peninsula are the warmest, the, the places on Earth which are, which are warming most rapidly. And in the Arctic, about a third of that warming is due to black carbon. So black carbon is having a huge impact on the Ar Arctic. And they've done some studies that looked at ice samples and snow samples and they've analysed the black carbon and brown carbon and where it comes from. And 90% of that is from agricultural emissions. What they're doing, since the USSR broke up in Northern Asia and the USSR, they burn the crops every year. They, they didn't, they've stopped that during the USSR years, but now they're doing it again. And in Kazakhstan and Northern Asia, they burn for the same reason they do in Africa, to, for the uh, stubble. They, they, they get rid of the grass, the old dead grass, for new grazing. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is where methane comes from. And you see that down the brown part of the bottom, animal agriculture is the, um, by far the biggest chunk, followed by fugitive emissions, the, the orange bit. Rice cultivation um, is responsible for 10% of global methane. Waste is responsible for 17%. And, um, yeah, that'll do. Next slide. Oh, yeah, <laughs> methane's led to, led to a few jokes. Actually, here's a, here's a really interesting thing. This is, this is a bit of trivia that probably won't be asked playing the game, but um, most of the methane from cattle, from ruminants, it's actually breathed out. What happens is that it forms in their, in their gut, in their, in their stomachs, and it's absorbed through the stomach wall into their bloodstream, bloodstream and it's breathed out with their uh, out breath. So, so cow farts or cow burps uh, are a thing of the past. It's actually, they breathe it out. Next slide. Ground level ozone is a real nasty. Um, it's getting to levels in Australia, commonly, that affect growth of plants now. And uh, it, it, um, it warms, it, it's had a warming impact about one-fifth of CO2 since uh, industrialisation. Next slide. Okay, so put them together, put the short-term emissions together with methane, which is not categorised, but I'll categorise it as a short, 
short-term emission. If you add those together, 39% of all global warming since industrialization has been caused by the short-term <coughs> stuff. So the message here is that the short-term agents are incredibly powerful. They're, they're much more powerful than uh, we're led to believe by the uh, current debates. Next slide. And in the literature, there has been a focus on this, again, recently. And the most recent, for example, there's a few that I haven't listed here, but the most recent uh, looked at just methane and just CO2. And they said by the year 2050, the, the, the most, what's the most effective thing we can do for global warming? And they looked at uh, if, if comparing it to 100% cut in CO2. Okay, so now we cut all transport, all, all the CO2 emissions. What's, what's that equivalent in methane? Well, you only need to cut 46% of methane. And I'll have the same effect by 2050 from however, there's a buggy man there. Um, I should, should have the grasp, but I don't. I'll, I'll just give you an idea. Comparing gases using global warming potentials is really dangerous, really difficult to do because they last for different periods and it's uh, different curves. For example, carbon dioxide is half of the carbon dioxide we emit now is gone within 30 years. But the rest of it tails off for centuries. And in a thousand years time, 20% of that original CO2 is still there. So CO2 is the nasty and we're still feeling the effects of what was emitted centuries ago. Okay, so that's the difficulty with CO2. So we've got to draw that down, that's essential. But the short-term gases, if you look at them, they're gone so quickly that we can have a really rapid payoff. Okay, uh, yeah, methane, for example, it's gone in 12 years. Tropospheric ozone, gone in a few days. Black carbon, gone in a few days. So, okay, next slide. Um, look, I just wanted to talk a, a little bit about uh, the, the, the the planetary boundaries that we face with tipping points, and then we'll move on to the BZE work. Um, the, the Copenhagen Resilience Centre has done amazingly good work pulling together uh, hundreds of, of different scientists around the world, and they've looked at what are the support systems that support life on Earth, what are the systems that are fundamental without which you couldn't survive. So in other words, if you just cut, if you cut just one of these systems or overstep one of these systems, does it endanger all life on Earth? And yes, and which are they? And they are these in the, in the circle. Um, and which of them are we approaching or have we passed the tipping points? And we've actually passed the tipping points on three of them already. The, the, the one which we most overstep is biodiversity loss. We're in the middle of the sixth great extinction. Uh, that's on the left hand side. The one on the right hand side is the nitri nitrogen cycle, uh, and that's nitrogen pollution. And I'll talk a bit about that later. Paired with it is phosphorus, which we'll, we, we won't touch really. And the one at the top is climate change. And they estimate that we have stepped outside the green on this one already. We have overstepped the boundary, we're in new land, we don't know what's going to happen. It could endanger all life on Earth. The other nasties are ocean acidification, uh, land use change, which includes deforestation, and global freshwater use, and no stratospheric ozone depletion, no surprises there. <coughs> Chemical pollution, atmospheric pollution, they're not quantified yet. Okay, next slide. So let's look at those in turn, just very quickly, and see what agriculture impact has on those. Okay, next slide. Right now, um, we are in the middle of the sixth great extinction. It's happening around founders, guys. The background loss in bean species is 100 to 1,000 times higher than we've seen in past millennium. And the reason for it is that we are trashing the planet. We are, we are reducing habitat and fragmenting habitat. Next slide. 
Okay, a study by the uh, Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency looked at this uh, back in 2010, and they, they looked at what's, what can we possibly do to stop this biodiversity crisis? And um, the, the uh, okay, if you look at the first graph, the one that's circled in blue, that's prevented mean species loss. And if you look down, what the the uh, the activity which can produce the most impact on reducing mean species loss is changing diet to a no meat diet. Very interesting. Up near the top, the second greatest bar, which is not circled in blue, but the second greatest bar there, is expanding protected areas by 50%. Um, I don't know about you, but I can't see our national parks and reserves being globally being expanded by 50%. But this, this first impact here, the no meat diet, they saw as the most effective way of reducing biodiversity loss, and the impact that it would have would reduce uh, MSA, mean species loss, by 60%. So, uh, next slide. Yeah, that's what I just said. <laughs> the most effective thing now. Um, look, I'm going to be talking about uh, ruminants quite a bit, and um, I should declare my hand here. Um, since since I've you know, started to see the destruction that beef production brings firsthand, I've changed my diet significantly, and uh, now I don't don't eat meat at all. But uh, that's, that's that's a uh, disclaimer. So you'll see that common theme coming through here. Okay, next slide. Nitrogen pollution, next slide. Okay, um, what we've done with the Haber-Bosch process is that we've been able to produce nitrogenous fertiliser at a greater rate than all the plants in the world can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. The blue curve is our human cause fixation nitrogen fix, fixing, and the pink is the natural, and we have exceeded it. So we've just turned nature on its ear, and it's all done through the Haber-Bosch process, and provides us with nitrogen fertiliser, which of course has fed the green revolution, um, which has uh, fed the world up until now. Next slide. So Jerry, that's from methane source, or do I have No, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that. Um, okay. But, but no, nitrogenous fertilisers are of course used on crops. But the, the nitrogen cycle is the problem. This is the, the, the nitrogen cycle imbalance is what has caused that, that tipping point to happen. And these are the effects on this slide of reactive nitrogen. Oh, the nitrogen soil is really interesting. Um, for example, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. I don't know, in your youth, perhaps your grandmother told you to go and pee on the lemon tree. Okay, I, this is not, I'm not trying to be funny, but uh, urine has an incredible amounts of nitrogen in it. Um, what is nitrogen? If, if you do a test for protein, the first level test they do is the nitrogen content. Okay, so if you take a food, any food, and analyze its, its chemical compounds, if it's, if it's high in protein, it's high in nitrogen. Okay, so nitrogen is essential for all life. It's essential for um, us as well as the other animals. But it's, it, it's created by that wonder um, of, of, of uh, you know, the plants producing it from sunlight, which is amazing in itself. But um, nitrogen from those plants goes into the animals and the ex excess is excreted. Now that excess, this is what happens to it from the slide. Um, reactive nitrogen, first of all it creates ozone when it's released in the air, exposed to the air, air pollution, it, it alters forest productivity, uh, that is you know, if you have high nitrogen uh, rivers for example or rain coming through it, 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 can, it can affect that. It acidifies fresh water and it, it is the greatest coastal water polluter. Nitrates from um, us, from animals, are the greatest coastal water polluter. 
Some of the nitrates are from uh, uh, fertilizer, but mostly it's, it's point sort it's, it's from animal production. And it eutrophies the water. You, you pour the nitrogen into the water, the algae goes nuts. You have an algal bloom, sucks the oxygen out of the water, kills everything. And you get these ocean dead zones. There are about, there are about three to 400 ocean dead zones now, and many of them are permanent. Um, and it's also responsible for stratospheric ocean ozone depletion. Okay, so next slide. So where does it come from? We talked about animals being nitrogen concentrators. Well, of the nitrogen that we ingest, humans ingest, 66 to 95 percent of that is lost. That is, a small portion of it ends up in protein, ends up in our bodies, in our tissues, but most of it is lost. And the excess becomes the polluter. Um, you might be interested to know that human waste is actually treated Whereas animal waste, which is many times more than human waste, in fact, the study they did um, around 2005 in the USA said that uh, animals produce 140 times more waste than um, humans. And none of that is treated. It, it's, it's either on the pasture or it, it's poured into ponds with big aerators that once again put the nitrogen up in the air, but um, they try to um, oxygenate it to break it down, but um, it, it escapes. So every time you have a uh, downpour, you get floods downstream and, and fish kill events uh, and etc. Okay, next slide. Um, we're looking at des desertification and soil loss. This is another of the uh, uh, tipping points. We'll look at climate later. Um, and, and this has to do with deforestation and fires that we mentioned earlier. 60% of all the land on Earth is now degraded, 25% is highly degraded. And the projected food production that we need between now and 2050, 60, when the population peaks, well, to give you an idea, we need to grow as much food as we have to date. That is, since humanity started, we need to grow the same amount of food between now and, and 2030, actually. So the food demand is just off the chart. Next slide. Um, that's where the soil degradation comes from. And interesting, I don't have a slide on it, but the, reef, the Queensland government puts out a reef report card each year, and they've reported that, that the uh, reef, which is now 50% of the coral is now dead, they've reported that the reef, the biggest impactor on the reef is actually uh, agricultural output from the Fitzroy and the Burdigan rivers into the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon. Now, it's it's basically the nitrogen, particulate nitrogen, and particulate phosphorus from grazing lands in the Burdigan and the Fitzroy. So what's killing the barrier reef? It's not one channel dug in, in the, along a reef which is some 2,000 kilometres long it's the output every day from the river systems that are ki killing it, and that's from the grazing lands. Huge amounts of soil that cover all the seagrass and change that. Next slide. Uh, fresh water. The Stockholm Inst International Water Institute put out a report in 2012 saying that um, the embodied water in food is, is at crisis point, and unless we reduce our reduction of animal food by 75%, um, we can, it's not sustainable. Humanity cannot uh, live on the same diet. Next slide. And this is the reason for that. Um, next slide, please. The reason for that is that um, if you look at the amount of water required to produce animal products, it's way, way more than plant products. Okay, next slide. Uh, just a couple of slides on the oceans. Um, we've wiped out, uh, uh, sorry, next slide. We've wiped out 90% of the big fish in the ocean. We've bottomed through all the continental shelves. 50% uh, of global coral is now dead and there are hundreds of dead zones. And you know, that picture, that aerial picture on the left bottom there, <coughs> of fishing off the, um, 
of the Chinese coast. It's just amazing. Next slide. This is uh, the North Atlantic and the fish biomass around 19, 1900. And note the red or high fish biomass on the cod banks of North, Northern, uh, North America. And next slide, please. And note now how they're all gone. They're all gone. In, in England, they used to have fish and chips, and that was cod. And now, cod's illegal, because <laughs> there isn't any. Uh, we wiped it out. Next slide. So we've now entered the Anthropocene era, which is the era of life on Earth dominated by humans. Um, and the concept that the impact, the footprint that we have on Mother Earth, the biggest thing that we impact is what we eat. That's, that's you know, coming into common consciousness now. Next slide. All right, but, um, just, just moving on to the land use plan. Uh, this will be released in coming months. The scope is very broad. Um, we, we had all sorts of problems trying to limit it to something that was, um, first of all, doable, but secondly, digestible. The, the amount of effort and the amount of, you know, how much can people take in from this stuff? Because while, um, you know, the stationary energy, for example, was, high impact for Australia, it dealt with relatively uh, few technologies, whereas the land use plan ranges, you know, from, um, you know, cows, farmers raising chickens, right through to uh, forestry and deforestation and that sort of thing. So, you know, the, the, the scope was incredibly broad. Um, but what we've exposed is multiple mitigation and sequestration opportunities, and we found these to be high impact. In fact, transformation, not just incremental, but transformation. These things are going to make a big difference. These are game changers. What we've also discovered is that um, this is not without controversy. In other words, um, we fully expect that there's going to be uh, necessary, we're going to have community engagement and robust debate. And that debate is essential. There's, you know, there's going to be critics of this because every farmer will have an opinion, every um, consumer will have an opinion, governments will have an opinion, industry bodies will have an opinion. So we, we, we're treading on toes. So um, this is going to be really critical that we have this discussion. Okay, next slide. What we did was we looked at Australia in terms of the sub-biogeographic -bi regions. And we overlaid that with data from all sources, uh, from statistical data, ABS data, um, from uh, productivity data, using all the growth models developed by SIRO and others, uh, including the University of Melbourne. Uh, we looked at the uh, deforestation, we looked at the the production on um, each of these areas. And we found that the critical areas for emissions, we found them to be deforestation, ruminant emissions, and soil carbon. Um, and I'll get on to those shortly. Next slide. I, you may not be able to read these captions, unfortunately. They're, they're a lot smaller than the last one. But this is a chart of the ANZIC categories. Now the ANZIC categories are agriculture, forest, stream, and fisheries, number one, electricity, gas and water, number two, manufacturing, <coughs> mining, residential, commercial services, transport, postal, warehousing, and construction. So what we've done here is really interesting. Uh, you see, we've, we've teased out the national inventories, the national greenhouse gas inventory. We've teased out the the emissions and the sequestration in the land use category. And what that's done is it's uh, it's shown, it, it's allowed us to show that the deforestation for a particular agricultural activity has been able to be attributed to that activity. So you'll see the first bar, which is agricultural, forestry and fisheries, it's, it's not only got the, the light pink above the line, which are the emissions, 
but it's also got the dark, sorry, the blue, the dark blue below the line, which are the, uh, the sinks. So this is the sink, this is the amount that, um, that reforestation and afforestation and regrowth is, is sucking down CO2. But when you separate that out, you can see that the emissions from agricultural fisheries are actually greater than the emissions from electricity, gas and water. This is done with standard 100 year accounting, by the way. This is straight out of the national inventory. So that by itself tells us that what we're looking at here, agriculture, forestry and fisheries, is the greatest emissions sector in Australia. You don't hear that often. But then we started looking for opportunities within that. Boat. So let's move on. Next slide. Okay, um, we found, uh, no, back one slide, please. Um, what we found was that um, if you look at the 100-year emissions standard accounting straight out of the National Inventory, we found that land clearing, although it wasn't attributed to agriculture, is actually the biggest agriculture emissions source. And um, the, you'll see, actually, we'll go through these, we'll go through these, I'll read them out. <coughs> the, the bar on the left is agricultural clearing and soil carbon loss. We then have enteric fermentation, which is the next biggest agricultural soils and crops, which is the next biggest, prescribed burning of savannas, which is the next biggest, followed by manure and on-farm energy. So you see that deforestation and the, and the subsequent soil loss from that is by far the biggest with a 100-year accounting. And um, followed by enteric fermentation. So let's just look at those two things first. Next slide. Okay, sorry, we looked at deforestation before. So we'll now look at the next one, which is uh, enteric fermentation. Now this is a real eye-opener. You've probably heard reports from time to time where uh, science promises great things with uh, cutting out or reducing enteric fermentation through different things. Things like uh, adding oil to feeds, uh, things like improving pastures to, to improve the quality of the feed the cows get and uh, other things like rumen um, uh, manipulation to, <coughs> pardon me, to change the, uh, the methanogenic bacteria in the gut. Okay, so if you look at this chart here, this is the second biggest category of agricultural emissions, I don't remember. So the category, first category on the left is, uh, I'll read them out, it's grazed beef. So this is beef cattle. Most of Australia's beef, by the way, produced in Northern Australia. Uh, the next category is grazed sheep. The next category is dairy emissions. The next category is feedlot beef. Now, here's really interesting. This category, feedlot beef, the fourth one down, that category is responsible for four and a half percent of all the enteric fermentation emissions. So, if we try to manipulate feed, etc., that's the target. So these manipulations apply to just 4.5% of all the enteric fermentations. The cattle that are out on the paddock, out on the rangelands, we can't do that. So, you know, it's a bit of a joke. So let's, let's go on. The, the next category along, the one that's barely visible, is goats, horses and pigs. So you can see that's, that's a minimal uh, category. The next one is feral camels. Um, so there's a bit of a blip there. You can see that the one billion camels in Australia are responsible for that much enteric fermentation. The next, the second last category is feral goats. So there's a blip there too. And the last category, which is greater than those ferals, is savanna termites. There have been not many studies, but some studies, and um, most of the termites in northern Australia, and the savannah termites actually put out put out methane, and the studies show that that's the amount of methane they produce, about 2% of the, 3% of the total anthropogenic methane. So there you go, you, the, the interesting thing here is that the first two bars, in fact the first three bars, are ruminants. 
that the first two bars are ruminants grazing on open pastures, that um, we can't affect their, um, their methane production much at all. The two ways that we can are by breeding to produce faster growth and breeding to produce smaller animals. Now, um, we, we also use uh, implanted growth hormones, which is used mostly in Northern Australia. Uh, I should, should point out, most of Australia's Northern beef production, where, it, where most of it's produced, is actually called industrial beef. It's the uh, Abolus indicus, the Brahman breeds, um, and most of that is, uh, ends up in hamburgers. The southern beef, the Bos taurus, the, the, you know, the, uh, uh, what's the backers, the McDonald's yes. egg, yes. Uh, Angus beef, as they call it, that's, um, that's the more palatable one, um, but, but most, of the, most of the beef is produced up north, and it's, and it's hamburger beef. But that is where we, we can't get to the cattle to manipulate their rumen. Um, we, we implant the hormones to make them grow fast, so that's reducing methane per year of growth, per kilo of final weight, and uh, we breed them for smaller cattle so that they finish quicker as well. Okay, next slide. Um, this is the um, this is the feedlot uh, emissions, and these these emissions are tiny compared to the enteric fermentation. But I thought it might be interesting to run you through it. The biggest emission on the left there is pigs, and most of that is methane. So that's the target of um, the uh, the uh, climate. Uh, the, sorry, the carbon farming initiative. By far, the bulk of the money from the carbon farming initiative has gone to uh, methane capture of uh, piggeries and to uh, waste them. And uh, so that's that's why. The next bar down is beef feedlot emissions. And most of that is nitrous oxide, so in the, in the, from the uh, urine. Okay, the next is dairy cattle, then comes beef grazing, sheep and poultry. Nine by a couple of World Bank researchers. And they uh, controversially uh, measured the amount of respiration. That is the CO2 actually breathed out by the cattle. They counted that. And they found that 51% of the global emissions come from uh, livestock. Um, I think they do a 20 year accounting as well. Um, uh, and CSIRO back in 20, 2005 looked at all the emissions to do with agriculture and they found that uh, just over 30% of, 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 of national emissions come from livestock production. Next slide. That was the Balancing Act report. Um, and since then, uh, different reports have come out, but the most recent has been uh, estimating that anywhere between 19 and 31 percent of emissions using standard accounting, 100 year uh, and conservative figures, between 19 and 31 percent of emissions are from food, and the bulk of that is actually livestock. Okay, next slide. Our BZD results, and don't quote me here because the report isn't published yet, and, and, uh, and this might be changed, but um, we found that using standard 100 uh, year accounting, 33% of our national emissions are attributed to agriculture, and 54% of national emissions using 20 year accounting, and including those short term gases, come from agriculture. And nearly all of that for the short term emissions comes from livestock. So we found that just over 50%, or actually just under 50%, of Australia's emissions over 20 years comes from livestock. Very interesting. That's what I've just said, but the 100 year graph on the right includes the short term emissions as well. Sorry, yeah, thanks. Okay, next slide. Um, just a quick note on Alan Savory. Um, next slide, please. Alan, Slav Alan Savory is a quite a character. He did a TED talk that went viral last year. Um, he was advocating uh, a global increase in livestock numbers, in ruminant numbers, to actually, um, well, the theory is this. If you get enough cattle together, closely enough, they'll eat everything. 
And if you shift them quickly enough, they won't eat it down too far. And their manure from when they were there is going to rejuvenate the soil. So the whole thing's going to grow better. Okay, that's how I'm so in a nutshell. The problem with that is that um, no uh, government trial or even industry funded trial has been able to replicate that. Uh, there's been a, several studies done in Australia, a lot of studies done in, in South Africa where the methods come from, and there are a few uh, sort of uh, marginal reports that do offer good results from the savory method, but no reports in the semi-arid tropics or in the arid zones, no reports have been able to do, have been able to verify that the savory method works. And um, the MLA, for example, did a trial published in 2010 across um, a range of properties, right, uh, geographically stretched and also size and also <coughs> vegetation classes, etc. And they found no benefit from the intensive uh, grazing trials. In fact, they found deterioration of the pastures and, uh, yeah, what happens is that they also found um, deterioration in the live weight gain because <coughs> if you let cattle graze at their own pace, they'll pick out the highly nutritious. The green pig is, is high in nitrogen, high in protein, so they'll go for that first. They'll go for the plants which, which are beneficial to them. They'll leave the weeds and the other stuff behind. Um, the savoury method, they graze everything down a certain level, which means they, they're eating both the unpalatable and unpalatable. So um, that also went against by weight gain. And the biggest killer of the savory method of all is that drought kills everything. So it, it might be that you've got good, but you know, you, you've eaten the plants down to just the right level, and it may be that you've got a lot of manure on the ground, but if there's no rain, it won't happen. Next slide. So we've got to recalibrate our vision of these beautiful, furry looking, furry gorgeous animals. They are actually four legged chemical factories. Uh, just while I'm on that point of uh, getting back to the point rather of CO2. Is there much more to go here? Uh, Sorry, we don't. We're going to go. We've got about 15 minutes left and we want to leave some time for questions. So is there much more for you to go through? Um, I've got about six slides. Yep. Okay, I'll see yeah. through it. Yeah, let's get through it. Okay. The, um, if we stop grazing, the, uh, the, the trees will grow back. And that's actually a huge, high impact uh, mitigation pr prospect. Next slide. One example of that is that, uh, next slide please. One example is that if, if the African savannas if they just stop the burning, nothing else, just stop the burning. 51% of the savannas are actually high rainfall and they would grow back to, to forests. Okay, next slide. Um, some people say too many people, next slide. Um, there's seven billion people, seven and a half. There's actually more than 60 billion livestock each year, bred each year. And by the way, the average Australian will eat 100,000 eggs in their lifetime. And, and livestock now, globally, livestock outweighs wildlife by 40 to 1. <laughs> next slide. And the, the, sorry, next, yeah, that's, that, no, sorry, back one. That's the projection of meat production to 2010. It's actually going higher again. Uh, so this is a, this is a major disaster. It just um, can't be continued. Next slide, next slide, please. Uh, Clinton's gone vegan. Next slide. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of discussion now, but it's getting to the same level. Um, a lot of publications are coming out saying, um, oh, this is the most recent one. That text there, diet's high in meat, eggs and dairy, now as harmful as smoking. How about that? <coughs> Next slide, please. Um, yeah, the, the biggest, the, the world's biggest um, uh, agency that looks at diet has recommended veganism. A lot of authors, futurists are coming out and saying the same thing. Next slide. 
and future food is going to be a lot different than what it is now. And that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> Time, but I'd be happy to uh, take questions for however long you've got. We want to we finish at about uh, 8 pm, so we'll take questions for 10 minutes or so. Um, I don't know if there's anybody who had a burning question right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, what is this? Um, the CFI Cup and Farming Initiative is heavy carbon, correct? The Vanderbilt. Any other questions here? Right. All right. Don't, don't can't. If you follow it, my opinion. Yeah, um, the carbon farming initiatives providing carbon credits or or incentives for savannah burning. I just don't, I just don't understand why. Is there a, is there a rationale behind that? Um, I, I didn't actually hear that properly, but you're talking about a carbon farming initiative. Yes. Yeah, it was providing it was providing incentives for savannah burning. Do you know what the rationale behind that is? Yes. Um, what happens is that they they do rightfully see savannah burning as a big emitter. And the studies that they've done indicate that if they burn early in the dry season rather than late, they actually halve the emissions from savannah burning. So that's what they've advocated. And there's actually several trials at, in the Northern End which are doing just that. Um, but, you know, once again, the, the, you know, that's a good thing. But the bulk of the money has gone into methane capture um, from piggeries and from uh, uh, landfill. And some of the money has gone into um, reforestation, but not much. Surprisingly little. Okay, next question. Uh, my question is, would uh, alley farming uh, with trees and those who have done it, 20% of the land can be under trees with cropping in between? Uh, has, that, has that included in your uh, possible solutions? Absolutely. In fact, in fact the, uh, the Ontario Emissions Report will actually provide numbers uh, for a percentage of the land within each sub-biogeographic region which should be given over to um, reforestation. Um, you know, we've got to feed Australia uh, so that's got to continue, but uh, we believe it can go hand in hand. And for example, a lot of uh, you know, beef producers right now, they have paddocks and they have areas that they, in the Brigolo for example, where they've got to knock the trees down every year or two or three. So they much prefer to let those paddocks just regrow and earn a bit of money off it. So yes, it's totally compatible with, with cropping and other farming. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, following on from the last question, um, I'm a farmer and I've got a bit bruised tonight, I might add. Thanks, you know, But I have to say, I felt that most of the practices you were describing were 20 years old. Um, and and uh, certainly in, in Victoria, we have uh, adopted management practices that I believe uh, are leading in, in uh, managing soil, increasing soil carbon and managing a, a lot of those negatives. Uh, well, you've given me one fantastic quote, seeing I've just become a director of a sawmilling company, that logging does not kill forest. But that's that will be a beauty. Now my question, my question is, exactly. uh, my question is, the indigenous people burnt all the time. Are we saying that their land management practice was wrong? Okay, um, several questions in that one, but um, you've got to realise that Australia has very different agricultural regions. And yes, there's a lot of practices that apply in Victoria, you know, such as enriching soil carbon, um, that are doing great guns and fully support that sort of stuff. E excellent. But the same things are not applicable for the bulk of Australia's beef production, for example, which is in the north, which is on the range rangelands and the savannah. Totally different industry to what happens in Victoria. Um, 
and sorry, what's the last part of your question? Uh, the, the the indigenous people okay. burnt all the time, didn't they? Yeah. Um, folklore would have that. There is quite a bit of anecdotal evidence to support that. But the studies that have been done, and now there's a lot of them, there's huge books being put out on, on burning uh, Australia. Um, and there's one came out just last year, which is a massive volume. And the, 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 the burning that's done now for the sake of pastures is just so different to what was done in the past. What the uh, indigenous people used to do was burn on a fine scale, uh, infrequent um, basis. They did it in small areas. They didn't do it over the huge extent, like 500,000 hectares, 500,000 square kilometres each year of Australia's north is burnt. <laughs> that's that's way beyond uh, any indigenous programs that would have been happening thousands of years ago. Um, but you can also say that the indigenous practices are anthropogenic too. So, you know, the, for example, things like the gamba grass that they're planting in Northern Territory now, it's going nuts and the biodiversity conservation people are also really worried about it because what happens is, you know, it's got extreme wet and dry seasons. What happens is in the wet season it goes rampant and feeds a lot of cattle, it's good for feed. But in the dry season, they put a fire to it and that burns everything. It just burns all the saplings. It, it's, it's changing, massively changing the biodiversity that the species mix in those areas. So, you know, we're filling with the landscape. And see, your experience as a Victorian farmer wouldn't be anything like that. So, um, you know, I come from the north. That's what I'm largely talking about. And this, by the way, is my perspective. Um, but, um, and, and, the, and the report will, will cover everything, not just the, the north. But yes, um, what we're advocating is each property in, within each sub-biogeographic sub region plant trees in harmony with agricultural production. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. We've got time for two more, just one here, sir, and then you and that will Could I just, uh, Jared, if I could ask you, can you, um, Kind of uh, captured in essence what the key takeouts that you're suggesting from the BZ <coughs> culture report that like he's going to say. The second thing of it, who is likely to be the people that are most anti your report? Or <laughs> <laughs> the group or the groups thereof? <laughs> who are you most likely to upset? <laughs> Um, look, it, that's a really good question because this is what we're aiming at. The plan itself is actually empowering because each of us can play a part in how we use Australia's land. And as you saw, ruminant production has the lion's share of emissions for Australia. So, for example, each family, each person, can change that overnight. They can just not eat red meat. But it also empowers the landholder to know what the emissions are and to, to look at what's needed to balance that. It also empowers governments and you know community groups to think about um, you know what can be done because the opportunities in agriculture are transformational. If we stop all vehicles tomorrow, the output, the CO2 output from those vehicles will be felt in millennia to come. If we stop beef production tomorrow, the result of that will be felt within years and within 12 years, total change. So this is, this is really powerful stuff. It goes against all of the um, you know, Australian government policies, of course, <laughs> of uh, increasing the age of the century, you know, Australia being the, the, the beef producer for Asia. But um, if we've got to have this debate, we've got to have this hard discussion. Do we want to turn over our, our agricultural production for, you know, we're onshoring the emissions, for God's sake. 
you know, if you export coal, you're offshoring the emissions. But if you export beef, you're onshoring the emissions. But we're burying the emissions here for something that's consumed in other countries. You know, if we had a decent price on carbon, we feel that straight away. And a price signal in food production is huge. It's going to have a major, major effect. And, you know, if we ever get a uh, price on carbon again, or even, then um, this should have a major impact at all levels. And, and you know, anyone, everyone can be involved. It is going to hit, hit everyone. That's why we want the discussion. Can I, can I watch when you uh, send a copy of the report to Barnaby Choice? Can I watch it? <laughs> <laughs> Look, the, uh, the report might actually be toned down a bit. Um, you know, but it's all, everything we've got there is totally defensible. So, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, these are interesting days. Because, you know, there's a lot of reports globally now that say that what's happening in Asia is that they're westernising their diet. And the, effect, the impact of that is totally unsustainable. Within 20 years, we, we're going to trash planet Earth. You know, the, the, the footprint, the global footprint now, we consume in one year what it takes one and a half years for the planet to produce. So already we're going beyond our means. Now, we can't just keep spending on that credit card without paying the thing off. Okay, last question. Uh, on the topic of uh, uh, warming due to nitrogen-based uh, pollution, uh, am I better off getting a composting toilet or sending my sewage down to the sort of treatment plant? Um, that's probably a question for Andrew Longmire. It's not my expertise. Um, but um, it's an interesting one. It probably depends on the bacteria that are used in the composting toilet. See, there are a big difference between the methanogenic bacteria and, and others. And uh, nitrogen pollution producing bacteria, uh, yeah, it probably depends on the bacteria too. Sorry, I can't give it. Clear answer. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Let's uh, give them a hand. Go the uh, we uh, of course are a volunteer-based organisation that exists on your uh, support. So if you'd like to volunteer or become a base load supporter, uh, please visit us at bzd.org.au. Our next discussion group is on the 5th of May, uh, Monday the 5th of May at this venue as well, and Dr. Uh, uh, Professor David Crowley will join us in person to speak about the latest IPCC report and talk about um, the latest in climate science. So please join us then. Thank you very I'd much. I'd like to thank you all for um, doing the talk at such a short notice. I found it very interesting and uh, it gave you a lot of um, skill for thought. And I'm looking forward to having your, your, your senior report. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.